Welcome to the fifth session in this course. Uh, my name is Rice, Charlie Rice. I am a uh, professor of law at Notre Dame Law School. And uh, we begin this class, as with the others, with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Last time, I mentioned that the natural law has two functions, really, in terms of the human law. Th things that can uh, help us do. One is, it can help us be uh, constructive in the sense of proposing uh, measures. And another way is that it can protect us, in that it gives us the ability to criticize the human law as being unjust. And this is a very big deal. The question right from the beginning is whether there is anything higher than the state. And the natural law tells us, yeah, God is higher than the state. His law is higher than the state. The contemporary culture and jurisprudence tries to organize society below that line up there without reference to the divine law and the, natural, and the eternal law. Even if they talk about a natural law, it's a secular natural law with no uh, lawgiver and with no uh, definable content. Now the real question here is, okay, is there any limit to what the state can do? Is a, any state law invalid? Is it void? Can a state law be void? The Joe Smith extermination law or Joe Smith extermination amendment, if they passed it, would that be valid? Suppose that they repealed the 13th Amendment. We all repealed the 13th Amendment. And we, we reinstituted slavery. Would that be a valid law? All right? St. Thomas breaks it down this way. The natural law, great advantage of the natural law approach, is that it enables us to say that there is a higher law, there is a higher law which prevails over the state law. Martin Luther King made this point in his letter from the Birmingham jail. And what St. Thomas tells us is that there can be an unjust law. It can be unjust because it's contrary to human good. It can be contrary to human good if it's beyond the authority of the lawgiver. These are, are uh, capsule summations of what Thomas is saying. Beyond the authority of the lawgiver is if, for example, the dean of the law school here at Notre Dame were to declare war on France. I mean, that would be beyond his authority. Or if it's oppressive. Or if it's a uh, very basic violation of equality. Inequality. These things are, are contrary to human good. Uh, a law that is contrary to human good, St. Thomas tells us, does not bind in conscience unless a greater evil would result. We'll get into that in a moment. The other kind of unjust law is a law which is contrary to divine good. And that's a law that would compel compel you to violate the divine law. In our federal law, we have a conscience clause, or a conscience provision, which uh, says that no physician or healthcare person can be compelled one way or the other on abortion. Suppose they had no conscience clause. And suppose a doctor were ordered, an army physician, for example, were ordered to perform an abortion. St. Thomas tells us that a law contrary to divine good, an unjust law, because it's contrary to divine good, may never, ever be obeyed, must always be disobeyed. You're going to die rather than obey that law. All right? So what about Rosa Parks? 
Rosa Parks refused to give her seat to the white guy, refused to uh, move to the back of the bus. Uh, what kind of a law was that? Was that law unjust? The law says that uh, you don't get equal seating in the municipal bus uh, because of your race. What was that? Was she obliged to obey it? To disobey it? But we think about it, uh, I mean, if, listen, if, if, if this was a law contrary to human good, why was that law unjust? Why would you say it's a violation of equality? Well, a, a law contrary to human good doesn't have to be obeyed unless a greater evil would result from disobedience. I think a good example is the income tax law. There's nobody in his right mind who would not agree that the income tax is shot through with inequities, inequalities, oppression, and so, and so forth. But we still have an obligation to pay our taxes because a greater evil would result if people didn't pay taxes. What about Rosa Parks' law? She was heroic, right? And she was heroic because she didn't have to disobey that law. Did that law compel her to violate the divine law? Uh, was that a law that was, in her respect, contrary to the divine good? What did that compel her to do? It compelled her to physically get up. Now, you could argue that what that law did was compel her to enlist herself in support of this segregation scheme. And you could argue, therefore, that that was a law contrary to the divine good. I don't think so. I think that, law, that was a law contrary to human good, where she was not obliged to disobey it, and was heroic precisely because she did disobey it, when she didn't have to. For example, you could imagine uh, some little guy years before, in the late 30s, for example, some black guy who refuses to obey that law. What's the price? The price is his house may get burned down. You're going to tell me that that guy is obliged to disobey that law? That, it, that he had an obligation to refuse to give a seat to the white guy? I don't think so. But there are some laws that compel uh, us to violate the divine law. And this was recognized in, uh, uh, you know, in Nuremberg. It was recognized uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, the, the German border guards, West German border guards, after the collapse of the Berlin Wall. They prosecuted and convicted border guards because under orders, they shot and killed people who were trying to escape. Say, so, well, uh, what should they have done? Well, the law is, is pretty clear. The law is, is that uh, you're obliged to disobey. And that's what St. Thomas would say, that where the law is contrary to the divine good, uh, if a law, for example, uh, would require a doctor to perform abortions, he's got to disobey. And actually, it was a federal court that, uh, that, that tried to do that. There's a case in Rhode Island uh, where Gray against Romeo, where the uh, court uh, was dealing with the termination of treatment from a, a patient, withdrawal of food and water, and the hospital personnel specifically objected. They said, we will not participate in withdrawing this food and water because we think it's murder. And the court said she had a right to have it withdrawn, 
that the patient had a right to have it withdrawn, and that the hospital people were obliged to do it. It actually didn't, uh, never reached that point because they moved the patient from that hospital and uh, uh, those personnel were never covered, never confronted with that, uh, that problem. This is the uh, uh, protection. This is why I mentioned it. I called it a, a protective, a protective uh, function of the natural law because the fact that we can uh, talk about such a thing as an unjust law means that we, we have a certain protection against the enactment of those laws. We can, we can stand up and we can say, wait a minute. There's no way that any legislative body has a right to exterminate Joe Smith or to exterminate Jews or blacks or whatever. That's a protection against the enactment of such law. And only a natural law approach will enable you to do that. That's what the West German courts uh, concluded after the Second World War in those cases that we mentioned uh, a few hours ago where they said that uh, uh, where the, the doctors had performed the experiments that it was no excuse that the law authorized it or even compelled it. They could not, uh, could not do it. Now, the principle that comes in here, the, the question that comes up is, okay, I am obliged not to obey a law that would cause me to violate the divine law. If I were a physician and the law compelled me to participate in abortion, I would be compelled to violate that law. Suppose I'm a nurse or I'm an, an anesthetist in a hospital. Do I have a moral obligation not to participate in abortion? Suppose I'm the guy who sweeps the floors in the general hospital where, among other things, they perform abortions. Do I have an obligation to quit my job? I'm the guy in the hospital who works in the, the gift shop selling newspapers and cards and things like that. It's a general hospital up on the 14th floor. They perform abortions. Am I obliged to quit my job because I can never cooperate in violating the divine law? This is an interesting question that we should lay out a little bit. The problem is one of cooperation. And cooperation can be of two kinds. It can be formal or it can be material. Formal cooperation consists of uh, direct participation in the act itself. The guy who is uh, actually handing the suction machine or holding the suction machine for the physician or the abortionist during the abortion. That's formal cooperation. Uh, more precisely, uh, uh, the traditional definition was formal cooperation is where you intend to carry out the evil act. All right? Formal cooperation in evil. Formal cooperation, this is cooperation in evil. Formal cooperation is always gravely wrong. It's always wrong. And that stands to reason. If you ask that guy who's in the gift shop in the general hospital, he say, well, why are you working in this place? And he says, because I want to do everything I can to facilitate abortion. And they do abortions up on the 13th floor, and I want to do everything I can to help that cause. That guy is in a condition of formal cooperation, and that is gravely wrong. Material cooperation is one of the most difficult questions, however. And it depends on the 
degree of cooperation. It depends on the uh, alternatives. And it depends on uh, uh, what, what actually, uh, uh, what he does. I mean, it, it, it's a, a very difficult question. And it's a case-by-case -case determination. Bishop Myers of Peoria issued a, uh, an instruction on this uh, not too long ago, in which he uh, drew this distinction. He said, for example, the person who is just doing general cleaning in a hospital where they also do abortions uh, would be in a uh, position where at the most it's material cooperation. He said probably he would not have to quit his job. That's, that can be a tough call, tough question, right? But it's one of the things we have to consider. Pope John Paul dealt with this in Evangelium Vitae. And he dealt with it particularly with reference to legislators. Legislators who uh, are pro-life. But the question comes up, suppose the legislator tries as hard as he can to get a total protection for the unborn child. And he can't get it. Could he then vote for a law that would be an imperfect law? And John Paul said that if the legislator, he's talking about legislators, if the legislator has made his own total opposition to abortion clear, that as a last resort, he could vote for a law that would not totally prohibit abortion, but would reduce the number of abortions. He could vote for that, provided that it would not have a sufficiently adverse impact on the public understanding, words to that effect. He could vote for that. That leaves aside the prudential question of whether he should. That's an entirely separate question that uh, comes up. Uh, in my opinion, the legislator uh, should not do that, but that should not vote for such a law. But that's uh, a material cooperation thing. You can't say that the legislator who uh, tries his best to get a law totally forbidding abortion, and then uh, they got him on the floor, they're ramming down his throat this imperfect law, and he decides as a last resort that he's got to vote for it because he thinks it's going to save lives. You can't say that that is, that legislator is acting immorally. Uh, I think a case can be made, and I, I would make it under the circumstances that uh, he is acting imprudently, that the incremental strategy has not worked. But John Paul says that that could be a legitimate form of uh, action and it would not be uh, a, a material cooperation in abortion itself. And that's a, a tough question. It's a tough question. Uh, because the issue here is uh, what, uh, what are you allowed to do? And it's a, an issue that is in the framework of this unjust law thing where uh, St. Thomas tells us uh, that uh, a human law can actually be void. Is that a law which is contrary to the natural law or the divine law is, uh, is an act of violence. It's not a law. And that can be uh, very difficult to, to deal with. Uh, for example, let, let me give you a, a, a tough question. We have in this country legalized abortion. Paul Hill went down in Pensacola and as the abortionist pulled up in his car to the parking lot, Paul Hill walked up to the door and shot him, killed him. Is that legit? Can he do that? How do you analyze that question? 
These are all issues which, in general terms, Thomas deals with, not in the context of killing abortionists, of course. But the, uh, let, let me, let's deal, let's take it and deal with it. Here's, here's the abortion facility, or the abortuary. Back here is the killing room where they actually perform the abortions. Now, there's a general principle of natural law that Thomas deals with, and of course it's in accord with church teaching, that you can defend yourself and you can defend others. If somebody comes at you with a knife and the only way that you can save your life is to shoot him mortally, it's the only way you can save your life. Can you do it? The answer is yes. You could do it, provided, however, you can't intentionally do it. You don't intend to do it. You don't intend to kill him. And here what we're doing is incorporating St. Thomas. Uh, uh, John Paul takes St. Thomas and incorporates him into the teaching of Christ. We're uh, talking here about Evangelium Vitae. In Evangelium Vitae, John Paul makes a very strong, uh, virtually dogmatic statements on three subjects. The killing of the innocent, and on abortion, and on euthanasia. All three, he said, are wrong. All was wrong. All was wrong. The intentional killing. When we say killing here, we're talking about the intentional killing. The intentional killing of the innocent is always wrong. Can you ever intentionally kill anybody? The only times when anybody can ever legitimately intentionally kill anybody are the just war and capital punishment. All right? The, uh, this is, St. Thomas would agree with that, does, and this is the teaching of the church. Both of these are by authority of the state, which derives its authority from God, who is the Lord of life. So the only time that anybody can intentionally kill anybody are the just war or the justified rebellion. or capital punishment. And these are severely restricted. In Evangelium Vitae and elsewhere, the magisterium has severely restricted these. The state has the authority to impose capital punishment, but the question of the exercise of that authority is severely restricted. So John Paul tells us that you can do it only where it is absolutely impossible to protect society in any other way. Really, uh, from the language, protect society from this criminal in any other way. Now, intentional killing can be justified only in those situations. But even in those situations, you can never intentionally kill the innocent. That's why, in the, even in the just war, which is a war of defense, basically, even in the just war, you can never intentionally kill non-combatants. You can never intentionally kill the innocent. That's why Dresden was a, an atrocity, the firebombing of Dresden, and in my opinion, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, although those may be more debatable. But the point is, you can never intentionally kill the innocent. Now, that's very clear. The only time you can ever kill anybody is in a just war. Now, suppose here, back here, we're in the killing room, all right, at the abortion place. And somehow, Paul Hill finds himself there in the killing room, or you find yourself there in the killing room. Now, you, there's a natural law right, deed of duty, to defend yourself and defend others. 
you can defend a third person. And even if it, if it is necessary to kill the other person, you can do it. But you can't intend to kill the other person. You can only intend to defend. So if the guy comes at me with a knife, and the only way I can save my wife is to shoot him, I can shoot him. But I can't, I, I, my intent has to be to save, to, to stop him, not to kill him. The human law doesn't analyze it that finely. And the human law doesn't get into these distinctions. But this is the principle of the double effect, which is extremely important. That an action can have two consequences, can have the intended good consequence, and it can also have an unintended evil consequence. And the action can be good, despite the fact that it results in the unintended evil consequence provided it's proportional and provided that that unintended evil consequence is not derived by means, uh, that the good consequence is not derived by means of that evil consequence. A classic example is the removal of a cancerous wound. Here's the wound, and here's the baby, little Nemo, swimming around in the wound. And the mother is, has a cancerous wound. And she can't, the wound has to be removed. And you can't delay the operation long enough for Nemo to become viable. To save the mother's life, you've got to remove the wound. Can you do it? Yes, even under Catholic teaching where it is imminently necessary to save her life, you can remove the wound even though you know that it will result in the death of Nemo. You don't intend that result, but you can permit it. And that's the double effect. That's different from the ordinary abortion where you go in and you intentionally kill Nemo in order to achieve a good effect the mother's health, or so she can go to college, or whatever it is. Your intention, what you're intending to do is to kill the innocent in order to achieve a good effect, and you can never, ever, ever do that. Similarly, where you have an ectopic pregnancy where the, the baby is growing there in the tube, and it presents a threat to the mother's life, you can remove the damaged portion of the tube, even though you foresee that it will result in the death of the child. But you can never intentionally kill the innocent. And you can never intentionally kill anybody, except in these defined circumstances of the just war or capital punishment. So how does that relate to Paul Hill? All right? If he were back here in the killing room, in the abortuary, if somehow he found himself there, and the doctor, the abortionist, were starting the abortion procedure. Paul Hill could defend that child. It's inconceivable, I think, that he would have to kill the doc in order to stop it, the abortionist. I don't want to call him a doctor. But he could defend that child. And if it resulted in the death of the doctor, it could still be a moral act, provided he did not intend to kill the doctor, the abortionist. All right? That's defense. Defense. Now, out here is the parking lot. And the doc is driving up. The abortionist is driving up. The Paul Hill walks up and kills him. Is that defense, or what is it? The argument is made, well, uh, that's as close as I can get. I can't get any closer. Well, if that's a justification. Then if the, the closest you could get would be in the supermarket or the video store the night before, then you could shoot them then. And that's really not defense. 
You say, well, this guy is going to go in there and perform an abortion. Yeah, but you're not defending. He's preparing. He's en route to do it. What you're doing, what Paul Hill was doing, was intentionally killing that abortionist to achieve a good end, which was saving the lives of the children that he otherwise would kill. Interestingly, Paul Hill, where Paul Hill's wife uh, was quoted someplace, where she said when uh, her children ask, where is their father, she replies that he is a prisoner of war. Interesting, because that really would be the only justifiable premise on which you could justify killing abortionists. Apart from the, the actual defense situation, if you, you were actually in the act of doing it. And if Paul Hill uh, could make the case that we're in a situation of justifiable rebellion in this country, then he could say, well, this doctor this abortionist is a combatant and he can be intentionally killed because justifiable rebellion is a subset of the just war. St. Thomas, incidentally, is very, is restrictive on, the, on, on war and even more restrictive on rebellion. Why? Because rebellion is a, a private enterprise kind of thing. In the, the just war, the just war is uh, carried out by duly constituted authority, which is a limitation on it. But in rebellion, uh, the rebellion is carried out by those who appoint themselves, in a sense, or are informally appointed. There can be a justified rebellion. Ours, for example, against the British. The rebellion of the, the Irish. From 1916 on to 1921, the 1918 election, the people of Ireland voted for separation from Britain. And you can see that that's a justifiable rebellion. But not here. Not here. Not here. And one of the arguments that is made for killing abortions, killing abortionists, is that the law, the human law, which forbids such killing, is a, an unjust law itself, contrary to divine good because it forbids the opponent of abortion from carrying out the divine law. That is, they claim that the divine law mandates that they kill abortionists, rescue the innocent who are led to slaughter. It's biblical. But the law of God severely limits, as John Paul tells us, the ability to take life. And this, uh, this whole question is a, a uh, a result of the, the evil that has been inflicted on our society by legalized abortion and by the entire Enlightenment uh, philosophy. Where we've lost sight of the law of God, we've lost sight of right and wrong, and everything is up to the individual. Where it's individual judgment and uh, open season uh, in the exercise of that judgment. So when we get into uh, these kinds of issues, St. Thomas is a reliable guide, and the magisterium is a reliable guide. And there are things that uh, you have to uh, hang on to. You have to hang on to the fact that no one can ever, ever, ever intentionally kill the innocent. That's why 
Nancy Cruzan's case. In Nancy Cruzan's case in 1990, what the Supreme Court authorized was murder. Because they authorized the withdrawal of food and water with the precise intent to end her life. Say, so, well, she wanted it, or they thought they had evidence that she would have wanted it, but nobody can even consent to his own death. In the sense of directly causing his own death. And this is, uh, is why uh, natural law is so important, because it gives us the ability to criticize these things. And it gives us the ability to put them in context. Abortion is always wrong. It's never justified under any circumstance. And the law must forbid it. The law must forbid it. The euthanasia, which is the intentional killing for the purpose of relieving suffering, is always wrong, as John Paul tells us in Evangelium Vitae. What John Paul is doing here is spelling out what the natural law means in the context of Christ. And the human law is subject to that natural law, is subject to that higher law. And the last thing I want to bring in uh, during this hour is this whole question of the Constitution. What about it? How does natural law relate to the Constitution? And what should be the duty of a judge or a legislator with respect to the Constitution? Well, the way to handle it, I think, is to remember that the Constitution itself is merely a form of human law. And if you put it in that context, the Constitution itself can be an unjust law. I mean, if, suppose the, uh, the uh, take the example, suppose they repealed the 13th Amendment. We repealed the 13th Amendment. We reinstituted slavery. Should a judge enforce it? A natural lawyer would say no. No. The legal positivist would say yes. There was a judge up in Michigan some years ago, Randall Heckman, a great guy who was, uh, he had a case in which a girl came before him in court and the issue was whether she could have an abortion. She was a minor. And following, if he followed the accepted procedures, he would have processed her and made the decision for an abortion or against an abortion or whatever, or left her to make the decision for herself. And you know what he did? He's not a Catholic, by the way. Courageous guy. What he did, he said, no one can ever authorize the execution of the innocent. And he refused to do it. That's the way a judge should respond. The local bar association tried to kick him off the bench. But he was absolutely right. Because the Constitution is just a form of human law. Now, interestingly, the Constitution contains natural law principles, right? For example, due process, cruel and unusual punishment. Equal protection. These are all natural law principles, sure. And the natural law uh, comes into play. They, it, as a matter of fact, I, I, I would offer the suggestion that there is no law which, uh, in our history, uh, a judge, which a judge would have to strike down as contrary to natural law because he could rely on the Constitution in, instead. Even Roe versus Wade is a violation, you know, the, uh, the allowance of abortion is a violation of the natural law. But it is initially 
a violation of the 14th Amendment. The natural law is incorporated into the Constitution in so many ways that you don't really reach the question of the natural law. You can handle the thing by interpreting the Constitution. So you, you wouldn't have to say, well, uh, legalized abortion, this state law on uh, abortion in Roe versus Wade, this Texas law and this Georgia law are void because they're contrary to the natural law. I mean, you wouldn't even have to reach that question. What the court should have said simply was that they violate the 14th Amendment, which guarantees to all persons the equal protection of the law and the right not to be deprived of life without due process of law. What the court did in Roe versus Wade, unfortunately, was to say that the unborn child is a non-person and therefore has no rights. And that, of course, is the reason why you have such horrendous results. But that's an outcome of Enlightenment principles, where you have a functional definition of a person and you have the uh, uh, allowance of uh, uh, this utilitarian treatment of persons, particularly in pursuance of the contraceptive ethic. But you wouldn't have to reach that question. Actually, it, it, let's, let's mention it for a minute. I, I can only think of one possible case where uh, natural law could have been necessary to decide the issue in our history. And that, that is perhaps Dred Scott, but the one I'm thinking about is uh, Brown against Board of Education. Brown against Board of Education was the case that held that uh, uh, publicly mandated segregation in, you know, state mandated segregation in public schools was a violation of the 14th Amendment. Now, the court decided that uh, the 14th Amendment was unclear on the subject. For the court said, well, we can't determine what the 14th Amendment meant. Uh, I think that's not true. If, if my supposition is correct, and if the 14th Amendment intended to allow segregated schools, segregated public schools, which I think it did. There's a lot of evidence on the point. Uh, and if public education today is the same thing as it was then, the Supreme Court said it isn't, but if it is, if it's the same kind of issue, and you have the 14th Amendment, if the 14th Amendment were intended to allow the segregation of the races in public schools, I think it, it's a, a case where you could make, uh, or where you could have to rely on the natural law to say, hey, that is a violation of human good. That's a, a law which violates equality and is contrary to the natural law. But uh, that's the only possible case. And I'm not, I'm not really absolutely convinced uh, of that, but uh, the point is that our Constitution incorporates uh, natural law concepts. And uh, uh, it would be a very rare case indeed where you would have to go beyond the Constitution itself in order to strike something down. But just as with the German judges after the World War, Second World War, uh, if necessary, a judge should do that. Justice Scalia recently said that if the Constitution authorized abortion, he would enforce it. I don't think that should be done. I think the uh, uh, 
uh, and, and the, the other justices on the Supreme Court, of course, take that same position. Because the Constitution is simply uh, a form of human law. And uh, it is of necessity subject to the higher law. So in this picture, what we've done, we've been talking, we, we've been talking about the natural law as a protective device, in a sense, to enable us to look at the human law and to say that some human law is going to be uh, void. That is, it will simply be void because it is contrary to nature, contrary to the law of God. And the ability to say that is itself a protection against the enactment of such law. This is a, a, a very important function where uh, they didn't have it in, in Germany in the 1930s. In 1935, the Germans enacted the Nuremberg Laws, which basically uh, put the Jews in the position of non-persons in various respects. And Gustav Radburg, who was a leading positivist jurisprude at that time, and later had a change of heart, suffered for it. He wrote after the war that when the Nuremberg Laws were passed in 1935, he said the German legal profession was disarmed by legal positivism. They could not criticize those laws as being unjust because they had adopted the idea that nobody can know what's just. They had adopted the idea that every law is valid if it's enacted by the proper procedures. And Rodbrook lamented that fact after his change of heart. And he, he raised the question, uh, you know, why were the German lawyers so ineffective? And the answer was because they had been imbued with the ideas of legal positivism, which uh, follows from the epistemological base that, uh, where you say that, uh, that nobody can know what's right or wrong. That's what Hans Kelsen was saying. If nobody can know what's right or wrong, then we leave those things up to the political process. And if the political process turns out Auschwitz or Roe versus Wade, who can say that it's wrong? And it's interesting to speculate what would have been the history of the 20th century if the German legal profession had reacted to those early Nuremberg laws with denunciation. If they had been able to summon the intellectual resources and the will to say, hey, you can't do this. As after the war, the West German courts did when they applied the natural law to strike down those laws. So the ability and it's an ability that is given only by natural law, the ability to stand in judgment of the state law and to say that there are some things the state can't do. That ability is a great protection against the enactment of such laws. And this natural law is one where we have to always keep in mind the distinction between objective wrong and subjective culpability. But it does give us the ability to say that some things are always wrong. And St. Thomas tells us that the natural law is a prescription for limited government in that the law should not try to enforce every virtue or forbid every vice, but some things the law must forbid. The two that he mentioned were murder and theft. 
And these must be forbidden by the law. And it's a prescription for uh, the common good to be promoted within limits and within reason by the state. But for all of us to realize that uh, there are some actions of ours, uh, that all actions of ours do affect the common good. And it's a, uh, it gives us an ability, the natural law, gives us an ability to say that we are not God and we don't have the right uh, to decide for ourselves to take the law into our own hands. As in the question of whether you should go out and shoot the local abortionists. Some things we, uh, we can't do because they're contrary to the law of God themselves. And St. Thomas is a great source on that. He's a great source on the distinction between for example, intentional killing and killing in defense. Where, pursuant to the principle of, dub, of the double effect, which is very important, you do have the right to defend yourself or defend others. And even if it results in the death of the assailant, that can be justified, provided, however, that you don't intend that death. Because the only time anybody can ever intentionally kill anybody is by authority of the state in the just war or capital punishment. Unfortunately today, we've totally lost sight of this. As the judge said in the Timothy McVeigh, after Timothy McVeigh was sentenced to death, the judge said to the jury, you are responsible to nobody, and that's wrong. As one of the people in Oklahoma City said to the media, Timothy McVeigh is not human. And that's not true. So in this natural law, especially as incorporated into the teaching of Christ, which we'll get into next time, as so incorporated by John Paul II, we have the ability to uh, put the, the human law in context and to make the reasoned case that the state exists for the person and the person does not exist for the state. And that perhaps is the uh, uh, most important point that, uh, that we have to keep in mind. Because as we're gonna see next time, uh, John Paul is telling us is that the foundation of society is the dignity of the human person. And that dignity uh, is, is a dignity resulting from uh, his nature as a being created in the image and likeness of God. And in that context, the natural law is a prescription for limited government because the state exists for that person and the person does not exist for the state. Thank you.